Hello and welcome to The Year Ahead, a podcast series where we explore the big themes and events moving markets and shaping the economy in 2024. Today, we're going to take a closer look at financial fragility. I'm Imogen Bakra, and I'm very pleased to be joined by Jan Nevrizi and James Taylor. I think in many ways, you've characterized 2023 as one of the more volatile in recent history. Um, It's been volatile for many reasons, but a big driver of that volatility has been um, concerns around financial stability and the risks that higher rates and a kind of tightening central bank cycle has posed to that as global markets have adjusted to a rapid end to the easy monetary policy that we've become accustomed to over the last decade. Jan, can you kind of set the scene a little bit for us from a sort of rates and macro perspective um, and run us through, you know, what was really driving those concerns around financial stability? Uh, What were the main flashpoints and and how did that affect markets in 2023? Imogen, I think it's worth uh, drawing a a contrast between what we had post-GFC and and during the COVID period, because what really differentiated this period was not only returning to ultra loose monetary policy, but also we had an influx of very, very heavy fiscal spending, which created this kind of almost imbalance of so much cash in the system, not much spending and accruing savings, accruing deposits that got distributed perhaps unevenly across the banking system. I mean, some of the what, what we saw in March where some of the big names that uh, went under, such as SGB, that was a classic case of just a very concentrated deposit base. The postmortem has been done in ex- uh, extensively, so I'm not going to do it again here. But the, the truth was there's so much deposits, ultra-loose monetary policy, very, very aggressive quantitative easing, which created just like buffer of uneven levels of, uh, of deposits in the banking system. Uh, fast forward a couple of years uh, post, uh, you know, post COVID. Now we're hiking rates aggressively because we have inflation, uh, you know, surprising to the upside for I mean, months or, or years, actually. Uh, so and what we're seeing is this kind of high interest rates, which tends to draw people or kind of depositors out of banks and into alternative investment vehicles like money market funds, for example. Uh, you have uh, quantitative tightening running at a faster pace than it did in 2018. Uh, and you also have a still a lot of fiscal spending, but on year and year, a drop in, in the amount that, of government spending. So all of that kind of created an environment where we were going to see some banking stress at some point. We just didn't know when it would come in 2019. The, the fragility in the system through quantitative tightening was uh, kind of illustrated in, in what was like a big repo spike as banks simply didn't have enough reserves to lend out in the markets. Uh, this time it was more so the kind of uneven distribution of how rate hikes and how quantitative tightening impacts different sectors of the, the banking system. And it was largely the regional banks that were uh, that hurt. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that, I'm sure. But uh, it so. You know, we, we kind of got to a point where, like, the longer we stay at these rates, the higher the probability of similar issues coming up in the in the future. Thanks, Jan. We'll, we'll definitely come back to all of that, of course, and thinking about the probability of similar events in the future. But before we do, James, was there anything you wanted to add from a more kind of credit perspective about the way you saw events unfolding this year? Yeah, thanks, Imogen. I think I'll just set the scene a little bit for, for credit. I mean, if you look at last year that was a really tough year for credit like from a credit investor perspective it was the worst total return environment in investment grade on on record and i think we started this year with a view that we probably would see a recovery both from the perspective of funding costs for issuers and then also from a total return perspective for for investors and and that's sort of how it played through for the first couple of months of the year and we saw funding costs move lower for issuers in euros in investment grade from sort of 4.9% on average to around 3.5. So a pretty quick fall in funding costs from, um, from the issuer perspective. And also from a total return perspective, investors had a pretty good start to the year. So in January and February, portfolios were up around about 2%. And that soft landing narrative that the Jan talked to was also in play. And then the first challenge we had to that positivity was, as, as Jan alluded to, in, in February, March, when we had the issues around SVB and, and then Credit Suisse. And clearly that was, at the time, a really big issue for, for credit, both in terms of what it means for financial conditions, um, but also whether or not you're likely to see any contagion risk from, from that event. And actually, the market shrugged that off in credit fairly quickly 
and fairly easily, and particularly in Europe, it, there was a, a view taken that actually a lot of the, the weakness was quite idiosyncratic and not necessarily systemic. But then I think as we moved even further through the year, it felt as though the higher for longer central bank narratives, the stubborn inflation, and then some growth concerns in terms of the, e- the EU and the UK in particular, rather than, than the US, really started to again increase funding costs on an all-in basis and started to challenge total returns. So if you look at it now on a year-to-date basis from an issuer perspective, funding costs haven't decreased. In euros, the, the underlying bund has moved about 50 basis points higher in yield since March. Credit spreads are about 20 basis points or so wider. So on the year, the all-in coupon for uh, an IG euro issuer has actually increased to around about 4.8%. And for context, the five-year average coupon is 1.9. So you've got a pretty expensive environment, again, for for issuers. And then if you flip the coin and think about investors, their total return 10 months into the year is just 2.73%. And considering that they sat on a 2% total return in in February, it tells you how underwhelming that is. So I think in summary to to this question, Imogen, I'd just say that we started the year with a, a, an optimistic tone and a feeling that both funding costs and total returns would, would improve. And then we've obviously had a few moments where that narrative has been compromised. And I think most recently, just by the, the, the relentless increase in, in yields. I just wanted to pick up on, I guess, what both you and Jan talked about when it comes to the health of the banking sector. You know, you rightly highlighted that although there were concerns here in the Euro, in Europe, I should say, um, it felt like they were idiosyncratic and the market kind of moved past those pretty quickly whereas perhaps in the US they felt a bit more systemic and perhaps that they would have wider risks to to financial the financial system as a whole in the US but you know we're in a scenario now where I guess the cost of living crisis high energy costs have depleted savings already Um, as you kind of talked about depositors are able to get higher returns elsewhere whether that be in kind of money market funds or just you know buying higher yielding short dated government debt which leaves bank uh, balance sheet I suppose vulnerable to to uh, kind of shift away from just um, household deposits. Um, and we also have a backdrop of, you know, very different central bank policy into 2024. You know, this year has all been about rising rates and the, the kind of timing and, and level of peaks. And arguably 2024 will be um, much less about the peak, but perhaps much more about the pivot. So how do you see that backdrop evolving for banks in particular? And Jan, perhaps I'll start with you and then we can move back to James. So you alluded that there was a little bit of an idiosyncrasy in, in Europe, but in the U.S., it really, I think, uh, splits into, uh, you know, looking at the banking sector, what, what you, you know, what listeners would imagine just being like the big GSIPs, like the money center banks, and what we would call like the regional banks that are not as large, still quite large banks, you know, in context of, of assets, but not quite like systemically important, uh, you know, like everyone can imagine like the top names that you think of when you kind of look at GSIP scorings, for example. So starting with the bigger names, I think the the issue there is not as, as acute because uh, they simply have enormous amounts of deposit bases that are so well diversified that they're just not going to be able to leave. And they're kind of like, at the end of the day, we have to keep in mind that deposits in the system are a closed system, uh, are, a, are a, you know, function of a closed system. So they're not going to just disappear unless there's loan repayments or quantitative tightening or kind of like some form of deleveraging, which will happen, but it doesn't mean it has to go through the through the big banks. So if there's a shift away or like flight to safety, it most likely would be from regionals into larger banks. That being said, uh, the issue with larger banks was during COVID, they bought up a lot of kind of like lower yielding assets. They made a lot of lower yielding loans uh, and kind of like their, their balance sheets are pretty much uh, chock full of assets that are not yielding as much. Uh, the, demand, the demand for loans has been falling a lot. We can see that from both loan origination, but also from the, the surveys that the Fed puts out, such as the Senior Loan Officer Opinion Survey. Uh, so what, what does that mean is just profitability might decrease going forward, but they still offer pretty low interest rates on on deposits. Their blended rates, for the most part, are still below 2% or at 2%. While when you look at the regional banking system, now you're seeing 
uh, you know, deposit rates that are reaching basically where the Fed funds, right, like closer to five and a half percent. You see kind of like one year term deposits like the CDs being offered at five and a half percent. Those are substantial rates, assuming that you have some portfolio of securities that you bought two years ago, which were yielding two and a half percent. Well, now you actually your net interest margins are turning negative fairly quickly. Uh, that doesn't mean that for the larger banks, the net interest margins are not going to decrease as well. But that process is happening at a much, much slower pace. Uh, for the most part, you know, all these banks have acknowledged that going forward, it probably would accelerate, which kind of brings me back to my point about money market funds. There is a lot more competition for deposits. And the, it, this is a historically well-known phenomenon. The longer we stay at higher rates and the more rates increase, uh, the kind of the pace of the outflows from banking system into money market funds increases as well. Uh, people just want to grab for an extra yield as they can their business model is basically adjusting to the overnight interest rate as soon as possible and pass it right through the uh, to the to the customer. But going back to kind of the regional banks, and I'll just finish uh, finish there. The, the, for me, the main problem is that there is they service a parts parts of the economy that are just not feasible for GSIPs. So think like commercial real estate lending, uh, which has been a big topic post SVB. It's really the regional banks that originate something like just under 70% of the CRE loans that we have in the country. And even like 35% of the, the, the overall lending in, in the U.S. is done by uh, kind of what we call smaller banks. Uh, so it's it's a still substantial chunk. Uh, you know, a lot of the consumer loans are more like a GCIP issue. But as loan demand slows down, as these repayments come in, and as we kind of go through like cycle of uh, refinancing, uh, things are certainly going to start weighing on the economy more and more. And I'm more worried about the regional banking system and the profitability, not profitability, not so much about some like sudden uh, meltdowns like we had in, in March, which, of course, they, they can always be in the picture, but it's hard to predict exactly when and which one. Uh, but I'm more so worried about like them acting as an anchor, like kind of drag on the economy over the next coming year as the impacts of you know, higher rates continues to kind of work its way through the through the system. James, what about on the European and the UK side? I mean, obviously, we don't have it in the same way this kind of regional banking dynamic as in the US. So the risks, I suppose, are are skewed a bit differently over here. Yeah, I, I think that's a that's a fair characterization, and I'd probably just start with you know some of the the somewhat obvious structural differences, but particularly when it comes to deposits to. To state the obvious, you do have a, a fragmented banking system in, in the UK and Europe where the money is just not able to, to cross those country lines as, as easily as obviously it can in, in the US. And also in Europe and the UK, you have a way less developed money market system. So the competition from money markets is just not the same as faced by the uh, by the US banks. And then probably the, the third difference I'll say up front is that the, the macro prudential and regulatory regimes in, in the UK and in Europe are much stricter when it comes to um, the, the securities portfolio. So there's definitely some structural differences. However, what we're seeing on the deposit side is less a reduction in deposits and more just a change in mix, which is really consumers and retail moving from non-interest bearing deposits to fixed term interest bearing deposits. And so for banks, that ultimately means a higher cost of, of funding. And then on the asset side, you still see margins as, as fairly pressured. So the net result is that net interest margin is being squeezed. And there's probably a recognition that we've passed the peak NIM uh, point in time and that actually banks are going to start having a, a pretty significant um, a headwind as, as, as respect to, to net interest margin. And probably the other dynamic, which, um, which Jan touched on, that's relevant for UK and European, as it is for US banks, is the impact of Basel 3.1 and what that will do in terms of RWA inflation. So there's definitely some headwinds from a return on tangible equity perspective. And the equity story for, for UK and European banks is, is fairly challenged. Uh, equity is trading at about 0.6 times book. So clearly, from an equity perspective, it's, uh, it, it's a challenging environment. However, Maybe more relevant for our audience and for this podcast, from a credit perspective, banks actually still look really strong in the UK and Europe. You've got very high levels of capitalization. You've got good liquidity levels, albeit cost of funding is increasing a little bit. And on the asset side, you really don't have any signs yet at all of, of asset quality deterioration. 
So I think in, in the UK and Europe, you see a, a big contrast emerging between the returns picture for equity holders and then the credit picture for, for bond holders, which I think is just much stronger um, than, a, than, than perhaps we expected in, in March. James, you talked about um, net interest margins being squeezed and I guess a kind of consensus view that we've sort of got past the peak in that NIM now. And I suppose when we're talking about that, we also have an eye on what we think the kind of central banking backdrop will be as we head into 2024. And Jan, you and I have both alluded to it earlier in this podcast, but perhaps you could just give us a kind of quick overview of how we see the divergences, I suppose, in terms of the ways in which central banks will kind of slow their tightening from active to passive and then eventually to to easing in, in 2024. I do see similarities as a lot of these central banks are kind of separating interest rate policy from uh, their balance sheet policy. Uh, in a lot of the cases, we expect interest rates to keep coming, uh, start coming lower next year, but uh, balance sheets to continue tightening or in the case of ECB to actually start rolling off the PEP, uh, you know, the, the PEP purchases. So just to recap from the Fed, we expect uh, the balance sheet to continue running down through 2024, even though we expect rate cuts in, uh, in starting in May. From the Bank of England, we also expect the rate cuts the second half of the year, but we expect QT to continue at this announced pace of 100 billion. And uh, and for the ECB, we similarly expect the PEP uh, purchases to start or, or to stop being reinvested. Initially, we see something like 50% of the purchases to be reinvested just to kind of provide support for spreads when they're needed. Uh, but, you know, this kind of marks a shift into a desire to let's let's lower the balance sheet, whether it is in the future to be able to intervene more effectively, whether it is to be able to transmit monetary policy more effectively through kind of trying to de-anchor front end rates from the from the kind of the bottom of the the ranges for the most part make uh, transmission a lot more uh, i guess like smoother the smaller the balance sheet is so uh in all cases we you know we to summarize we expect the rate cuts in next year but at the same time balance sheet policy normalization i.e reduction uh through 2024 as well james how do you expect that kind of central banking policy backdrop i suppose to affect the liquidity environment and funding levels yeah, so I think there's a few ways in, in which that's going to affect the, the funding environment. Underlying yields are higher due to the, the volume of, of supply and the volume of issuance from, from, from the governments. And you can see a much higher degree of, of term premium in those yields. So I think that issuers to some extent are going to have to get used to having higher cost of, of funding, given that credit is always going to be anchored off, off those benchmark rates. And so even if we do see inflation start to come down and we start to see the ability for, for central banks to, to start reducing rates, I think there is a point that the yield environment from a credit perspective is just now structurally higher. Uh, the other thing I would note is that when you look at the, the relative value proposition for investors in buying investment grade credit in particular, by comparison to government bonds, it looks really expensive. So if you look at the, the ratio of spread to yield, which really tells you as an investor how much of your investment grade coupon reflects the credit risk that you're taking over and above the, the risk-free rate, in euros, the five-year average credit spread represents 140% of the coupon. And that's because obviously rates were, were negative in, in euros for a large part of that, that time frame. Whereas if you look today, your credit spread is just 40% of your total coupon. So your pickup versus gubbies is extremely low on a historic basis. And of course, you're, you're uh, downgrading your liquidity by buying an investment grade credit rather than, than a government security. So that, I would say, very challenging valuation picture is leading to uh, a slowing and in some places a reduction of the inflow into credit products in favour of, of government bonds. So I think the, the net result is that you've got a um, you know, direct effects of, of higher costs due to the, the move in, in government yields. And I think you also have a bias for credit spread widening as some of those marginal inflows are directed towards government products rather than, uh, rather than credit. However, I do want to finish the answer to this question on, on a slightly more, more positive note, because no doubt you do have those, um, those headwinds. But from a, a credit spread perspective, we do think that the widening bias is going to be limited due to a couple of, of really important factors. 
One of which is that credit quality today and on a forward-looking basis is still very good. So if you look, for example, at how banks are forecasting their, their cost of risk and impairments, it does feel as though the underlying credit environment still feels very benign. And so that's a really important mitigation when we think about the direction for, for credit spreads. And the other crucial factor is that supply from investment grade credit is likely to be relatively modest. We don't expect to see a massive pickup in, in new issue volumes. And that is because a lot of corporates have used the low rates of the last few years to really term out their debt maturity profiles. And that's taken a lot of pressure over the refinance, off the refinancing schedule over, over the next couple of years. So I think, no doubt, the change in the, uh, in the underlying rates environment, central bank environment, has increased funding costs for, for issuers. And we do think that that's a phenomenon that's likely to continue into next year. But we think that the, um, the downside, if you like, from a credit spread perspective, from a cost of funding perspective, is limited by the fact that credit quality remains good and supply is going to be modest. OK, I like to finish on a positive. <laughs> so I guess wrapping all of that up then and, and given your experience, you know, not just through the last couple of years, but I suppose also through previous cycles of central bank easing and, and then or rather tightening and then easing. What would be your advice for those who will have to deal with this kind of ongoing fragility in, in markets, whether that be to do with kind of finding or finding the right markets, the right timing or accessing markets at, at the right time? How would you kind of advise customers going forwards? Yeah, it's a really key question. And, and a lot of what I'll say now will, will link to, to the last answer. I think that the first thing is that issuers should be prepared for higher funding costs and for, for marginally lower demand. And I think the way to, to prepare for that is, is invested diversification. So really looking at, at new markets and products and currencies, potentially beyond the, the playbook that's been used over the, um, over the last few years. The, the second point I would say is to recognise that there's going to be the potential for more volatility. You know, quite clearly, central bank support has dampened volatility across the board. And as that withdraws, we would expect to see a much higher degree of, uh, of vol around credit as well. And I think from a new issue perspective, that means narrower windows and a more nimble approach to, to funding. So again, speaks to that tactic of looking at more products, more currencies, having more levers to pull to achieve annual funding targets. And then maybe the, the third thing I would say is that investor decision making is going to be increasingly based on credit fundamentals. Central banks not supporting the market to the same degree. So you're going to see much more divergence between credits and, and sectors and, and differing credit qualities. And so I think it's really important that issuers recognize there's a, a really fundamental change going on in terms of the way that credit investors are looking to, to generate returns and, and approach their investment decisions. And so I think investor relations becomes extremely important in that regard, you know, investing the, the right amount of time to both diversify that investor base but also to really articulate the credit story, because from an investor perspective, that's probably going to be the key marginal driver of their performance, rather than calling the central bank correctly, which has been the marginal driver of performance, arguably, for the last 10 years or so. It doesn't feel any easier to do now than it does, has done over the last 10 years. All right, that was great. Thank you both for joining me. Uh, and thank you to our listeners for listening in uh, and viewers as well for tuning in. Uh, just a reminder to follow us on social media to get more insights into the year ahead. And remember to click the like button so it's easier for others to find too. Thanks.